Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, where we have so many interesting things to discuss. We're not only going to talk about movies, but we're going to talk about video game sales, too. Oh my goodness, how the business is a-changing. But let's start with comic book movies, which, for better or worse, continue to be the lifeblood of uh, the theatrical uh, business model right now. So, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Had Marvel died? Everybody was wondering. But it looks like it's still got a pulse. Maybe even a strong one. Because Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 not only had a great second weekend hold, it had like a spectacular one. Oh my goodness. Remember last weekend, or all through the weeks, a lot of you were asking me, what kind of hold does Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 need to have? And I said, as long as it's got a 5 in front of it instead of a 6, that should be really good. How about a four? Because that's what it got. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 fell just 49% in its second weekend, tying itself with Doctor Strange, apparently a movie that James Gunn saved. We'll talk about that um, with his notes. But it's the third best hold ever for a Marvel movie. And, you know, even beyond Marvel, it is extremely rare for a major blockbuster because they open so big to have that kind of second weekend hold. Oh, my goodness. What's more? Worldwide, in just two weekends, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 has passed half a billion. In just two weekends, that's already surpassed Quantumania's entire global run. Can Guardians of the Galaxy get to the billion dollar club after all? I think it entirely depends on the strength of Fast X and the Little Mermaid who are finishing out the month before the ridiculously crowded June where I suspect everybody's gonna have a problem financially. But we're talking May. So, if they're strong, Fast X is expected to open quite big. Uh, we'll see. I'm seeing it tonight. Uh, and The Little Mermaid is also expected to have a solid, if not strong, debut. Then I think Guardians of the Galaxy still ends around eight to nine hundred million, joining recent MCU entries Doctor Strange 2 and Black Panther uh, Wakanda Forever. And that's great. That would be great. Not every movie has to make a billion from Marvel. As I said, as long as it can clear 800 million, I think it's sitting, it's sitting pretty. And I think this movie should definitely clear 800 million at this rate. But if for some reason, one or both of those movies uh, doesn't connect, which is possible, very possible, is Fast X finally too ridiculous? Does The Little Mermaid take too many liberties or maybe not enough? Does it play it too safe? Are people tired of these live action remakes? We'll see. Then Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, I think maybe could hit a billion by the end of the month. Again, when that, the wall of June hits. Now, is this a reprieve for Marvel and James Gunn, who were sweating something fierce last weekend when Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 first opened and underperformed? I would say yes and no. And be sure to share your own thoughts on this down below. Now, first off, uh, I think that superhero fatigue is indeed a very real thing and should not be easily dismissed. Some people are like, hey, if the movie's good, the movie's good. No, people can't eat the same thing all day long. Well, it's interesting because I think that there are those of us in the comic book space who have been trained by, this, you know, by our stacks to read not only many, many superhero stories, but to read them simultaneously, not just week to week, but Wednesday by Wednesday. <clears throat> so we're like, bring it on. I, I can keep track of all these things and all these different mythologies. Not a problem. But don't forget, the comic book audience is the smallest audience. Uh, and the reason, by the way, the reason in comic books, because you might be like, well, then why did Hollywood uh, adapt so many comic books if so few people read them? Well, that's because that mini history lesson here, uh, after The Matrix debuted and was so successful and people were like, I love seeing humans do crazy stuff, and Hollywood hates original ideas, they were like, where is there a bunch of stuff that has a proven track record and involves humans doing crazy stuff? Oh, I know the comic book market and so that's how that happened uh, but people still even though normies enjoy the superhero stories I just don't think they can take that many of them I don't think you can recreate the stack experience in the in the wider marketplace uh, and that's interesting because I I think they assume that they could but they should have just like Kevin Feige should have realized that nobody liked Marvel now in comics and no one likes Marvel now in the movies you know same thing uh, I also just, so I, so I think that regular audiences, which are the bulk of audiences, are thirsty for something different, which could really help Fast X and The Little Mermaid. Also, while it's great for Marvel to prove they've still got it after the soul-searching flop that Quantumania turned out to be, 
they're not out of uh, choppy waters just yet. They've got two more huge speed bumps on the near horizon. They have to solve this whole Jonathan Major situation, which looks like, you know, his court date, his first thing, he showed up in court just to like get his full court date. Uh, you know, he didn't even have to show up in person. He showed up virtually. He has to be in court in June. But look how long this is going to, it looks like it could take quite a while to play out. And Marvel has to decide how long that they want to ride it out. So the Jonathan Major situation. And then also the Marvels, which they played a trailer for uh, when I saw Guardians of the Galaxy again recently. I loved it, Volume 3. I thought it was so great. I thought it really, really held up. And it was a great, great rewatchability factor, in my opinion. But anyway, the Marvels, and I suspect the Marvels, which so far does not, I mean, to be fair, we've only seen one trailer, but it does not seem to even be engineered. Like, they're not even trying to make it a four-quadrant film. Uh, I think it could perform at the level of Quantumania or potentially even worse than that, to be honest with you. Even if it's a good movie, by the way. I'm not saying The Marvels is a bad movie. It might be a great movie. But I think it's clearly been made, as I've said before, to appeal to the She-Ra, Netflix's She-Ra, and the Bee and Puppycat crowd. And I think those people will champion that movie. And it's going to need it on social media. So you're going to have two armies colliding on social media. But how many tickets does that She-Ra Bee and Puppycat crowd represent? I mean, I'm certain they represent a fair chunk, and they're also the Marvel diehards who will go check it out, right? But, I mean, is it enough to to have a return on like a $200 million plus budget? Probably not. So I think that that's going to be a real speed bump for Marvel. Uh, But it's weird because, again, I I feel like that one they totally did to themselves. Like, that's like that kind of an approach should be like a hundred million dollar budget or maybe even 70. If you can get it like to 70, then I'd be like, do whatever you want. I'm excited to see if it works out. All right. So anyway, also, I'm sure Kevin Feige did not appreciate the headline going around all weekend that James Gunn claimed to be the MCU special ingredient. I couldn't believe the chutzpah on that one. Remember how the Russo brothers were suddenly dead to Foggy once they left after Endgame? He was like, I don't know her. Well, I wonder if the same will happen with Gunn. Uh, Sure, Kevin Feige seems like a really easygoing guy, right? But this is the guy who greenlit Civil War only because Batman v Superman had been announced at Comic-Con. I mean, it was the Russo brothers, by the way, who narked on him. So maybe that's why he's upset with them. So, yeah, and again, another statement to the press. Is Gunn's statement even true? I take it with a grain of salt. I think he's trying to uh, create confidence in his upcoming DC slate, you know, being like, I'm already an architect of something you love. Uh, so I think, that's his, I think that's what he's trying to do. And it might explain, though, you know, to be fair, uh, why the MCU, after they had to distance themselves from Gunn because of his scandal, I mean, they brought him back to do Guardians of the Galaxy 3, but he's not really been a part of that family in the way that he was. Why Feige went all in on Rick and Morty writers, right? I mean, I think it's reasonable that he would be like, who else is like James Gunn? Ah, uh, Rick and Morty writers? But that turned out to be a really bad idea. Uh, and as for Gunn, if he is such a magic bullet, if his, if his, if his notes, uh, if he writes in gold ink when he gives notes on scripts, then why is the rest of his stuff still so niche? Why weren't the Suicide Squad and Peacemaker Guardians of the uh, Galaxy level hits, right? or performed on par with all the MCU movies he claims to have fixed. Uh, But again, back to Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. It's nice to see a movie that many fans, including myself, think is excellent, Rally. And it's also nice to see that the fan favorite franchise Marvel, which whether you like it or not, does a ton of heavy lifting still in the movie business uh, across the board, still has a pulse, as I said. And to be honest, though, I think the real magic in the comic book blockbuster formula is making something that can excite hardcore fans, and not annoy them, but is also accessible to normies in in tone, story, and length. Uh, You know, I think some of us, again, get very excited about two and a half, three hour movies, but other people are like, I'd like to do something else this evening or today. Uh, And so I think that's just, you know, it's a balancing act. It's something to consider. And I put a poll out over the weekend about Superman, because we were having a lot of arguments over like, what Superman should be like. And I was like, wait a minute, I think we're actually all coming from different source material. And again, uh, that's why DC, I think, continues to have a problem. So many people go, that's not my version of the character, and I'm upset about it. Uh, Whereas Marvel is adapting characters that most people, to a degree, don't know very much about. So they're like, I don't care what you do with it. That seems cool. That's why when they get into more popular characters, although they did a pretty good job with Spider-Man, right? But when they start doing Fantastic Four, 
uh, I'm nervous about some of they're making some risky choices let's see how it goes over when they finally reveal it I got some more information over the weekend and I was like okay let's see um, let's oh I don't want to okay I don't want to give it away all, all right let's but uh, so anyway <laughs> let's just say someone in a big Disney movie right like in the past or cup coming couple of months uh, is potentially, they have to accept the offer, is potentially going to be a member of the Fantastic Four. Uh, it's what you'll never guess it. All right, so anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, when they have to do the X-Men 2, I mean, people have a very strong feel. Although Foggy seems to be a huge X-Men fan, and he helped, he, he, was, he worked on those original movies at Fox, although a lot of people, hardcore fans, have problems with that. So, so I think that'll be interesting as well. Uh, so I'm very, again, very curious to hear your own thoughts on this. All right, so as for the rest of the top 10, wow, look at Mario go. Still number two with just a 30% drop in its sixth weekend. Here's you something new, right? If you're looking for something different than superhero stories. And while I maintain the film isn't at all accessible to normies, the mega success of Super Mario Brothers continues to underscore just how many Nintendo fans there are, even casual fans, because it's a casual movie. You see Mario do the jumping, and he grabs the points, and you hear the sounds, and you're happy. Uh, and I, also, the people who love them. Nobody I know plays Nintendo, but the people who love them are like, you want to go see that movie again? I'll go with you. And so I think it's just really incredible. We'll see what Super Mario's drop is this coming weekend, though, because, of course, uh, it hits digital for sale tomorrow. So that, but we'll see. You're going to see some other movies are on digital now and are still doing pretty good. On the all-time chart, Super Mario Brothers is currently at number 15 domestic and number 24 worldwide. Uh, I still don't think it's going to be able to crack the top 10 in either because it's just too much money left to go. And again, it's going to hit digital tomorrow. But it's still an incredible, incredible achievement. But and also, now that they know what they have here, and maybe they can maybe loop in normies a little bit on the next entry, but still make sure fans are happy, well, then maybe the sequel, Super Mario Brothers 2, can get into the all-time top 10s domestic and worldwide. Uh, we'll see how long it takes for Universal and Nintendo to announce what their next step, their next steps are. They're taking a minute. Usually, a studio will announce their next plan pretty soon after a movie uh, does so well, especially like this. I would say they're waiting for Comic-Con, but oh, we're in the video game space now. So, may and also Universal, you know, they could present at Comic-Con maybe, they could, you know, but I think they're gonna probably, video game fans made this a hit, they're gonna stay with video game fans. So there are a couple of big summer uh, video game events I know coming up. And then also, of course, they could always do it on one of the upcoming Nintendo Directs, which always managed to trend. Also, Nintendo's been a little busy launching a little game called Zelda over the weekend, which I've even seen uh, in the headlines because it's just, again, that big of a hit. Uh, incredible reviews, huge lines outside of GameStops, everywhere for the drop, uh, and such strong sales out of the gate that some in the game industry are predicting it could be the biggest selling game of the year. I'm sure Universal is paying very close attention to this launch. Look at us talking video games. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought? Oh, I love it. Book Club 2 failed to counter programming, to counter program. And I think that's not only because post pandemic, the, the first one came out before the pandemic. Post pandemic, it's simply not the kind of movie you're going to pay to see in a theater. Plus, it seems it sucks because it has very bad, uh, its cinema score is awful. The first one had a much better cinema score. And while Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 and Super Mario Brothers both had great holds, there was still room for other movies in the marketplace as well, with everybody enjoying solid holds across the board. Plus, even though Evil Dead Rise is now available for digital purchase or $20 rental, oh, expensive, it's still holding up in theaters, as is Air, which hit Prime Video itself over the weekend at no extra cost. Uh, it was truly a tale of two box offices, though, for Ben Affleck this weekend, with his much lauded air, and then the head scratcher hypnotic. What are you doing in that movie, Ben? Uh, it would seem Affleck does his best work for himself, so it's good news indeed that he's hoping to direct and star in a remake of Witness for the Prosecution next. Have you ever seen that movie? Great movie. Uh, unfortunately, Knights of the Z but I think it's ripe for, I think he'd be good for a remake on that. I think it could work. Uh, unfortunately, it's not one of those movies where you're like, don't touch it. It's, I think they could do it. Unfortunately, though, Knights of the Zodiac, I feel bad. So many of you were so happy I, I mentioned it last week. But it couldn't debut in the top ten. 
My theory, and I'll be curious to hear yours, is that I think it's too Americanized to capitalize on the recent stateside popularity of Asian and South Asian content. And while BlackBerry has excellent critic and audience scores, IFC films just could not move the needle for a theatrical release. Maybe they'll have better luck on digital. I like Jay Bruchel, and I love business talk, but I mean, come on, look at this compared to Air, and that might also be a problem for this movie. But Air, oh, that's definitely a theatrical release, but Blackberry, that's digital, or maybe even streaming, quite frankly. Uh, all right, over to streaming. As, as always, let's start with Nielsen for, uh, for mid-April, where, wow, look at Beef Go, number one. Word of mouth really did propel the show in its first full week, because it debuted uh, April 5th, uh, a Wednesday, on Nielsen. If only it weren't for that David jo uh, Cho controversy. That's like uh, the also successful The Woman King. The Woman King was successful, uh, saying that they were, they were the real life, highly egregious Dahomey tribe. What a mistake that ended up being. Uh, if only beef hadn't cast David Cho, no matter how good he is in the role. And if only the Woman King had created a fictional tribe that they said was an amalgam of real life tribes, because they did address and condemn the evils of the Dohemi, but I don't think they went far enough. I also have another theory about this, which I'll share in a minute. But we'll see what happens with Ezra Miller's The Flash, Jonathan Majors, again over at Marvel and all, his whole career, and then J.K. Rowling's new Harry Potter series. James Gunn, whose situation is closest to Cho, as they both made, it seems, extremely poor taste jokes. Uh, no one's come forward saying they were the person that Cho was uh, joking about. But only James Gunn seems to have survived, and he's the only straight white guy in the group. So take that for what you will. Uh, by the way, how did Beef become number one here when it's never been number one on Netflix's charts? Well, that's because Netflix's charts are global, because I thought that was weird too. So I went back to uh, Netflix's charts. I looked at April for this week, uh, and Beef was indeed number one in the United States. N Nielsen is in the United States only, while The Night Agent was a global phenomenon, and so number one on the worldwide chart. Hmm, interesting. All right, so as for the overall, as for the rest of the overall chart, Mando still holding its head high, steady towards the top, right? It's never been able to get like top three, but four is excellent for that show. While Florida Man is a big win for Edgar Ramirez. That's huge for him to break into the top 10 and shows continued strong interest in Latino talent. Uh, in fact, Florida Man pushed Ted Lasso, Lasso out of the overall top 10, which has been struggling in its third season. Same with Picard in its final season, which is only able to barely make it into the originals chart, despite having multiple seasons to back it up. Uh, that's how some shows can cheat in the Nielsen ratings, with just uh, tons of extra episodes against new shows. Over on Acquired, though, Succession's legendary season four, episode three, did boost it on the Acquired chart, and it almost had the numbers this week uh, for the overall chart. Let's see if it can break into the overall chart as an Acquired show by its season finale, May 28th. Only two episodes left. Uh, as for movies, not too much happening here once more, although Peacock and Prime Video did get into the top 10 with their streaming debut for theatrical releases, you know, way past, you know, way down the line, but they're, they're new to the service. And that underscores, Bob Iger talked a little bit about this in the Disney earnings call on Thursday, um, this, or, or was that Wednesday, on Wednesday, uh, that studios now, what they want to do is make movies for theaters again, then put them on digital, uh, for sale and then for rental, and then make them a small teeny tiny bonus on streaming services down the line at no extra cost once they've already squeezed all the possible cash out of the theatrical release. Uh, on that note, look at Netflix's movie chart for just last week. Uh, a Man Called Auto finally hit thanks to Sony's deal with Netflix. That's uh, Sony is using Netflix as their streaming service because they don't have one. And it took the number one spot. Not very strong numbers, but it's still number one. And almost all of the top 10 here are theatrical releases, some of them from quite a long time ago, uh, that are new to Netflix for the, for this is the first week of May. So new to Netflix this month and people watched it, which is another reason why I think your Disney is doing the Disney vault again. And they're going to take some content off and cycle it again, just like to, I think, get the same effect. It's pretty annoying for viewers, but I think from a business perspective, it makes sense. Uh, with shows... Now, and I think, I have to tell you, from a, even from a fan perspective, it'll be a little more exciting to watch those movies because you're like, oh, I better watch it now instead of like, I guess I could watch that for the billionth time, right? You know, and I just, I think, I think making that stuff available all the time cheapens it a little bit, right? You don't watch the whole thing. I mean, I don't know. Maybe some of you like that, but I'm, I actually think bringing back the Disney vault would be a good idea. 
All right, so with shows, uh, now these are some strong numbers for uh, uh, the prequel Queen Charlotte, proving the Bridgerton still got it. And while the Night Agent is still doing very well in its seventh week, look at that, Beef <clears throat> has already almost dropped out of the top ten in just its fifth week, uh, is the steep drop in interest due to that David Joe controversy, which really blew up uh, over the past few weeks and got even worse when um, the cast decided to stand with him. Uh, on iTunes, surprise, surprise, Guy Ritchie's The Covenant is number one, overtaking much flashier studio fare, Dungeons and Dragons, which has already been on, this, on iTunes for a, about a week now. But Evil Dead Rise just debuted, and I'm surprised that Guy Ritchie, although Evil Dead Rise is still in the top ten and theatrically, and The Covenant is not. But people are loving these military stories, and I do believe that The Covenant, while I'm sure it appeals to multiple groups, it is getting a strong boost from conservative audiences. As for this coming week, in theaters, Fast X can Vin Diesel inexplicably deliver yet again. As I said, I'm seeing it this evening, and the review embargo lifts on Wednesday. And Master Gardener opens in limited release. Uh, on digital, as I said, Super Mario Brothers hits Tuesday. While well, over on streaming, there's just one new movie this week on Friday, and that's from Hulu, the remake of White Men Can't Jump. Why would anybody remake that movie? Uh, we'll see. Do any of you plan to check that out? Uh, while with shows on Wednesday, uh, this is, there's some interesting shows this week. A uh, High Desert on Apple TV from Jay Roach with a pretty solid cast. Uh, and then uh, there's a slew of docu-reality series. There's the family Stallone, get it? Like Family Stone, but Family Stallone on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, that's crazy. I know he's having financial issues, so he's decided to go the Kardashian route. Let's see if they can do it. Uh, McGregor Forever on Netflix and working from the Obamas, but not only produced by them, but narrated by Barack Obama, who will not host the show, but he, they, they're saying he has featured appearances in the episode episodes, but he will appear on camera, uh, at least in a limited capacity. So that, that sounds interesting. Then on Thursday, The Geography of Bliss with Rain Wilson on Peacock. And then to All the Boys I've Loved Before spinoff, so don't underestimate this, but this isn't a movie, this is a series, XO Kitty. Finally, on Friday, they're selling sun a Sunset returning to Netflix for season six. And then HBO Max brings over Romanian uh, show Spy Master, uh, which they say has been a big hit for them overseas. So they're going to see if U.S. audiences are interested. So that's this week's movie math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you, what do you think about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3's amazing second weekend hold? What do you think it says? And what do you think it doesn't say? Share those thoughts down below, subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.